Hey Reluctant Preppers, this is showing you just how easy it is to purchase silver without paying any premium over spot price. You just go to sdbullion.com slash rp, scroll down and enter the special code to get silver without any premium, and they'll mail it to your mailbox, discreetly packaged. Inside you'll find a beautiful 10 ounce bar of fine silver, and you are able to purchase that and have it and add it to your stack and your collection without paying any premium. And you're supporting reluctant preppers along the way. Thanks. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been a long time since we've had this uh, distinguished returning guest with us. Robert Ellis Smith is the founder of the original and oldest journal on privacy in the world, the Privacy Journal, at privacyjournal.net. Is that correct, Robert? That's correct. Uh, 44 years. We're delighted to have him back on Reluctant Preppers. He's in our corner, always informing us on what is the breaking uh, edge of protections and privacy uh, for individuals and for our families and what steps we need to do to be aware of so that we can protect our right to privacy. Robert, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Well, it's good to join you again. Before we launch into some new questions just for you, I wanted to see if we could get your perspective on a topic that we just covered with a recent guest. Uh, and that is the topic that was announced by Mark Zuckerberg, a ch uh, f Facebook CEO, about Facebook at announcing publicly that they are using artificial intelligence to scan the mental state and the thoughts of people based on their actions online so that it initially then the ostensible purpose is so that they can help to do early detection and prevention and intervention with through the authorities of potential suicide uh, victims or people who could potentially be a harm to themselves or to others by using artificial intelligence algorithms and high-speed processing to infer their thought process or their mental state based on their online actions. And he explicitly said this technology is advancing and evolving to where we can use this for other things other than suicide prevention in the future. And one report said that, that so far Facebook has already activated over 100 uh, police calls where they would do what are called uh, wellness checks or welfare checks on people to show up and just without a warrant enter the people's uh, premises and say we, we have reason there's been a report that uh, you may be needing to be checked on to make sure everything's doing well here and so if we could get your your expert thoughts on what is in I think you brought this topic in general up over a year ago and we spoke with you about the last the last vestige of our true privacy is the privacy of our own thoughts, and and we're about to lose that. And your your prediction certainly has come true. It looks like in the, in this last year. So if we could get you to weigh in on what's the latest there, and what protections may still be, what remedies or what um, options to opt out of this, may, people may still have. Sure, it's probably the flip side of a technology that uh, uh, it, uh, would would allow. Um, the, the a, a, a person with a disability to merely think an intention, and the computer would convert it into action, so that if the person didn't have limbs or something, um, just the very thought of wanting to turn an automobile left could be converted by artificial intelligence intelligence into to action. And uh, what Facebook and others want to do is to use the technology of being able to. Uh, probe into the mind and see what thoughts or predilections might be there. It's just too tempting for marketers, obviously, to uh, have a, a means for finding out what other human beings are merely thinking about in the way of uh, purchases or particular family needs or economic futures. And it's uh, very spooky. I know I have battled for about 30 years against the use of lie detectors, which is really a... a um, a primitive form of technology which purports to uh, detect tremors in the voice and in sweat patterns to determine whether a person's telling the truth or not. It's kind of a bogus technology. 
But this particular one is not bogus. I think uh, artificial intelligence can indeed uh, probe the mind and, and come up with a person's intent. And it has lots of benign applications, but I think the one in marketing, first of all, is very trivial. But uh, the, the, the one that would uh, purport to uh, record what people's intentions are could have dangerous implications. So we've had for years uh, claims that you could uh, label people who were potential criminals, and this technology would kind of fit into the, that to, to uh, stigmatize people, to track them, to monitor them based merely on what a computer says they're thinking. And do people, ordinary people who do not wish to be scanned and in some ways uh, treated as guilty until proven innocent by some faceless, nameless computer deciding that their thought process or their Im inferred thought process isn't, isn't uh, acceptable, is there any way to opt out? Well, th these will be used in lots of contexts where there um, is no uh, right to opt out. In, in employment, for instance, uh, uh, this, a form of this technology can be used at the beginning of the workday to tell whether a person is uh, uh, impaired or not. It, a form of this technology has been used probably for two decades with airline pilots, a form of determining impairment by analyzing what's going on in their minds, not by merely looking at their actions. Um, that's the trouble with some of these technologies. There is no opportunity to opt out if you're in an employment context, number one, or number two, you're going through a security line at the airport and you're not notified that while your person is being searched, so is your mind. And these technologies get m more and more affordable as we go along. And so I can well visualize that there would be a device uh, uh, right next to the physical screening devices at the security gate that would purport to indicate whether a person had bad intent before getting on an airplane. So uh, the traditional uh, reliance on one's consent doesn't really work in these new technologies, I think, both because they're very, very small and covert and affordable, uh, but secondly, they will be employed first in those relationships in which people uh, um, are subservient which is to find transportation or to hold on a job or to get housing. And there's also been advances recently in automotive technology. Everybody who's tried to fix anything on their car in the last couple of decades has increasingly uh, faced up against the, the complexity and how many, it used to be like, there were no computers in the old cars, and then there was like the computer or the processor for electronic ignition in, your, in the you know mid-70s cars, and then it got to be more and more. And now they say there's some people, depending how you count, say there's anywhere between 100 to 200 computers in an average car. And more than that, these some of these computers are tracking everything that the car does, everything that you do. Where, everywhere you go, the speed and everything, and uh, there was some. You said that there was some recent uh, litigation or uh, court cases at the highest levels about your right to privacy of of the, the wired car being a gateway into searching about your history. Um, can you tell us about that? Sure. There is a case before the Supreme Court that will probably be heard in the next couple of months. As most people know, the Fourth Amendment uh, requires mostly a warrant. Uh, prior court approval to um, uh, to uh, intrude upon somebody's privacy, whether digitally or, or physically. And the question in this case seems rather narrow. Uh, an individual was using a rental car, but it was not rented in his name. He had permission to use it, and the police uh, wanted to and did search the automobile without a warrant, saying that uh, this was a third party. He had no Fourth Amendment protection. It was the um, individual who rented the car whose interests were at stake here, and he wasn't there. And the question for the Supreme Court is whether a warrant will be required for that. Some of my allies in the privacy area uh, simply sent over a, a memo to the court, and one in which I signed off on, um, uh, indicating that an automobile is no longer a... a, a, a a piece of steel. It's 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 a computer on wheels, as we said, 
Um, it not only the black box, which many people are familiar with, that keeps not so much personal information, but certainly information about the comings and goings of the vehicle, weather conditions, uh, breakage, um, <clears throat> turns that are taken, and and the like. But also uh, 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 OnStar, which many people are familiar with, in in the new form of that technology, uh, connects automobiles to a central database. Uh, recording every single movement of that car, including the number of occupants and the fuel consumed and the temperature inside and the stops it makes, <clears throat> the amount of braking, braking, the amount of acceleration it does. just keeps an endless uh, log of information about the automobile. Uh, in the course of preparing this, I discovered that uh, automobiles now are uh, connected with social media uh, as, I guess, a convenience to the driver or the person renting it, or the owner of the, the vehicle. But uh, that means that any search of that vehicle is going to open up uh, a probe into what one has been doing on social media or on email or, or texting. Concern used to be about texting when you were doing it and whether that was a distraction from your driving. But um, these new systems in automobiles will have the content of the texting as well, and that's a that's a huge uh, treasure trove for law enforcement, especially if they don't need a warrant uh, when they pull over somebody for a suspected traffic violation. If they're able merely uh, to search all of that at that point, you can see how it opens up a lot of information to law enforcement with no uh, court supervision. So that's one of the current issues going on. I also discovered, too, that cars will be connected with each other so that people on a joint uh, trip can keep in touch with each other and uh, coordinate their their movements. I'm not sure if people really need that, but if it is offered, it's another example how the car is not an isolated vehicle, but in fact part of a vast connected world. In this arena, do people have any rights to opt out? Is there anything that you can, just like people can sometimes get their uh, second airbag disabled if they're going to have a, whatever, a child in the front seat or that kind of thing, or something changed about their vehicle if they don't want this? I think I'm right about this, that most state laws say that you have to get the approval, the permission of the owner before you probe into the black box that uh, keeps track of movements uh, in case of an accident. So that is some protection there, yes. I don't know what the rental car agencies are doing um, with regard to um, this new technology. They're very proud of it. I hope that they're telling rental customers of the presence of it in the cars and whether they allow a customer to opt out at this point, I don't know. And uh, that leads to talk about other vehicles that are, are in the news from a technology standpoint, how it's changing the boundaries of technology. And, and drones have certainly been reported a lot about in recent years. It, it seems like we can't hardly turn on a show on TV without... And now I'm now I'm sensitive to it. I see it like my wife and I like to sometimes watch HGTV where there's like they're showing this couple looking at a farm or whatever. They're looking at some people looking down in some island nation and they, they'll have these lovely aerial shots. And in the past, you either don't think about it. But if you do think, wow, this must have been expensive to produce because they probably use helicopters and airplanes and stuff. And somebody clued me into that. Say, no, 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 that, those are all just drone shots. It's very, very inexpensive these days to get that. So. Uh, how are drones changing the landscape of uh, people interested in guarding their, their rights to privacy? Yeah, I don't think we should overlook the danger of drones. I think it's, we're going to see more and more clashes between these tiny things and aircraft, which is going to be um, tragic. But beyond that, uh, drones allow for um, very little investment. They're certainly affordable to most people. They allow for the monitoring of the neighborhood, comings and goings of your neighbors. They allow you that the drone can alight right on the out, outside um, windowsill and peer and what's going on. They can be equipped with uh, cameras and recording devices, of course. Some of them can even be directed to go inside a, the premises. Uh, certainly to go inside a shopping mall is not very difficult at all. All of this, of course, instructed um, remotely from, from, from afar. Um, and uh, so it is now within uh, uh, the reach of a lot of people, nosy people, who want to uh, gather information about uh, how individuals uh, spend their time. They've been a great boon for law enforcement, of course, especially in the western United States, where it's extremely expensive to patrol lands 
either privately owned lands or public lands where there might be criminality going on. And, uh, and drones allow that to be done for uh, very little cost. But there is an invasion of privacy here because it's remarkable uh, what they can pick up. Um, I attended uh, college uh, graduation last year and this year and uh, was uh, struck that there were drones going up and down the march of graduates, uh, probably some parents wanting to preserve the moment. But it was pretty spooky to see these things flying at such a low level and so quietly and so convertly uh, taking uh, images of all the people there, none of whom had consented to any of this, even though they were in a public place. So you just apply that to uh, uh, flying over people's backyards and peering into their houses, and it's a tremendous invasion of privacy that uh, has to be addressed more than it is right now. What do you see as viable ways of addressing that that, that are possible? Well, uh, make it uh, certainly illegal for any monitoring of private individuals by voice or, or by image uh, through this technology. That's one thing that, that could be done. You perhaps could regulate the time and the manner and the use of, of these uh, devices uh, um, that they have to be used for certain applications and not frivolous applications. Um, require a, a license uh, for uh, the very small drones. Currently, no license is required for uh, the, the smaller ones. and. Uh, those are the ones that are affordable to the average individual. And I think it's very important, not just for safety, but for privacy as well, for some regulatory body to keep tabs on when the, these are being flown around and, and how, and, and uh, perhaps even give advance notice to the community that they're going to be around because uh, some of them are going to start falling out of the skies and injuring people. So. Um, I think those are some of the first things that could be done. You could, uh, you know, I, I really hate uh, those uh, backup alerts that are part of uh, most uh, large trucks uh, installed because OSHA has such a regulation. But you could have something like that where it was required that drones make some kind of a sound or have certain lights so that everybody knew that they were around. That's another possibility. Taking it a little closer to home, uh, there's this huge boom in sm what they call smart speakers, which is uh, in some ways a euphemistic name for these listening devices that, uh, in people's homes. They go by many different names. People know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to name them by name here because, uh, well, just not going to. Um, the uh, But uh, these things are... Are they humble servants or are they Trojan horses? Because we've heard of uh, recently where even some criminal cases were prosecuted and evidence was, was presented because these devices that are awaiting your every beck and call, to, waiting for you to use the activation command to get them to respond to you, are constantly listening and are transmitting what they're listening to, everything that's said in your home, up to a centralized server. And there's algorithms that are processing that data all the time. And of course, we're told not saving it. But um, but at the time that they acti you activate them with the command, then they can respond. But that we're told that in some legal cases, these were introduced as witnesses because they could hear, for example, in a domestic argument just prior to a, some action that was that happened. Um, so what do we need to know about these so-called smart speakers that are listening devices in our home? And and what do people maybe not know about those that they need to know? Well, first thing we have to know is that they're always on. Um, in order to hear your instruction or the clap of your hand or whatever it is that activates these devices, uh, they have to be on when they're not in use. And although they sit dormant on a shelf or on a table in your house, uh, that doesn't mean that they can't listen in. They're, they're in essence, a wiretap that is always on. And it is presumably put into the home or the premises uh, with the knowledge of the individual. So there seems to be no uh, invasion of privacy issue here or, or constitutional issue involved. They're also easy to hack, and that has to be, be known, that uh, it's not at all difficult to install malware on these devices and to manipulate them so that they do what the uh, bad guy wants to do and not what the uh, owner of the premises wants to do. They can be programmed uh, to respond to a, uh, um, a sound that can barely be heard by, uh, by humans, the command 
telling them to do something. Meaning, I guess, that some interloper in your house uh, could uh, surreptitiously uh, command those devices to do things that were not in your best interest. Or perhaps outside the house to um, send a command to uh, your favorite little device, uh, asking it to do things um, that are not in in your interest. So I think uh, that's uh, important to realize that it also, because of some of the applications, it's quite possible that these devices will have programmed into them um, the dimensions of your house and the aspects of it so that uh, your commands to it are more meaningful to whoever is providing what will be done. We see this now with these uh, automated robotic vacuuming devices. In order to work, they have to uh, work properly. They have to have the dimensions of your home, and that's connected to the uh, provider of the service. People don't really realize that, but what you're doing is giving up the dimensions of your home to an outsider whom you have no control over and no knowledge of whether uh, some uh, snotty kid is sitting in a console somewhere uh, ripping off that information or exploiting it in some way. That that's Those are some of the dangers in these devices. We have reached the point where the yield from this new technology may not be worth the, the risk and privacy. How about social security number protection, privacy, and any new issues? We had you on a couple of years ago, and you talked to us about ways of, of withholding your social security number legally, ways of protecting it. And um, what's new on the front of social security numbers? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I consider that one of the linchpins of privacy. It, the more we can control the spread and use of that number, the more we can have some measure of, of privacy. Uh, one thing that the Internal Revenue Service has done, I think, in a good move, is to uh, now uh, ex- accept uh, employers uh, putting only the last four digits on the paperwork that you get every January about your earnings, uh, the W-2 form. That'll help a lot. The last four are not absolute privacy. Uh, they are pretty good privacy. But with those last four digits, people, if they care enough, can probably piece together the full number. But for the masses of population, I think it does provide some privacy. And I'm glad now that IRS, beginning uh, this winter, will accept uh, W-2 forms with only the last four digits of the Social Security number on it. I had uh, always advised people, too, don't give up your Social Security number except for some tax-generated transaction. And then I had to have a big exception to that, except for uh, Medicare where it's right on the face of the card, and every time uh, older people get medical attention, it's right there for anybody in a doctor's office to see and copy down. That's changing now. Uh, The Medicare administration will now reissue um, cards to everybody without Social Security numbers on them. And that was one of the last uh, bastions of misuse of Social Security numbers, I think, and I was glad to see that that was implicated. That implemented it as well. They're both independent actions by two separate uh, agencies of government, and they'll take place uh, in the late winter, early spring of next year. Those both sound uh, constructive, and I've had some personal experience trying the strategy that you had recommended of saying when when signing and you're getting to a new medical lab just to give a blood test or something and they've got the social security number uh, blank on the form you can just leave it there and if they question it say yeah I don't give it out and and they uh, about four out of five times I've tried that they just shrug and, and move on um, one said it's required and I don't know how I don't know how I could you know, further contest that because I, I wanted the service and if they were going to deny the service, if I didn't comply, I don't know. But it, it worked most of the time. Yeah, and I find that over the phone too. Uh, if you don't give your social security number, they move on to something else. They claim, of course, they need it to make a match to uh, allow you to uh, get access to your bank account, your brokerage account, your credit card account. But when you say, I don't give it out, and, and you may invoke a little uh, body language indicating your fear of identity theft, uh, they move on, and they'll find something else. The date of birth is a better way, I think. It's not as sensitive as the Social Security number. Uh, incidental to this, I was asked by a doctor, oh, doctor's office about a month ago to provide my driver's license for treatment. Now, and I declined to do so, and that caused great consternation in the reception area and was 
put down on my chart when I visited the doctor. He said, I, uh, you wouldn't give your driver's license. And I said, they couldn't give me a reason why they needed it. Uh, I, now, I, I was aware that there is such a thing as medical identity theft. There are people who get medical attention using other people's credentials. But that wasn't the reason. They, he said, oh, I merely need it on, on the folder here so that I, I don't mix up patients. I can look at your picture and know that it's you. And I said, fine, I'll provide you a photograph next time I'm in here, and you can put that through your little reading device instead of my driver's license. And that seemed to calm them down. I, and now that's what I do now. I, I bring a photograph. I was just at the doctor today and presented a photograph, not a uh, driver's license. Oh, that's good, because you're, you're addressing a legitimate uh, need that they have rather than... So it takes it from an adversarial type uh, conversation to one that's actually constructive and collaborative. Yeah, I think uh, it's very important to probe and see why they want it. If there's a good reason for it, you may go along with it. So quite often I have been told a reason for wanting to gather certain information, and I have, you know, the light bulb's gone off, and I have said, oh, I see, okay, it makes sense. And often, though, the, the person who's who's in the execution role, the, the functionary who, who you're facing, the only thing they'll know is because that's my job and I was trained to do my job and you're getting in the way of me doing my job and I've got to do this right or I can't do it at all or I'm going to get in trouble and that kind of thing. So they, here you had to talk to somebody who was the, not the first person you met but, but someone behind the scenes that finally told you, here's the real reason we need that. That's right. It may be me, but I detect in doctors' reception areas a, a, an attempt to belittle or not dehumanize but infantize people, I think the whole business of calling them by their first name and, and that. And so I think staff do that. And this driver's license requirement was like a prison, you know, another way to dehumanize people say, you know, around here, you're a number, you're not a, you're not a name. Uh, so there is that, that, that added element to it as well. Uh, and meanwhile, I'm being asked to sign a form that I have received the HIPAA privacy notice. And, um, yeah. I, I signed yeah. that sign that a lot and then they never make any effort to give me the notice we're talking about. I have right. to ask for it more than once. Uh, let's, talk, let's shift this focus to a big picture of uh, geopolitical uh, changes. We have the European Union, the EU, that is coming out with a big new regulation that comes due on uh, May 28th of 18. So it's a lot of businesses in the U.S. and frankly all over the world are hurrying to implement uh, all kinds of uh, information system upgrades and changes and, and searches and that sort of thing to be able to comply with this regulation uh, that involves both the protection, the transparency, the accessibility, the changeability, deletability uh, of people, of personal information about individuals. And you can tell us more about that and how in some ways does that uh, mirrored or, or conflicted with the direction that we're going in the U.S. with the new administration and, and the government uh, agencies we have that are, are helping or not helping uh, with individual privacy regulations. Yeah, there are some companies, as you say, hurrying to comply. There are an awful lot of other companies hurrying to avoid <laughs> um, and to figure out a way around these regulations. They're not that new. Uh, European countries have required for many, many years that in order to export data from Europe, for instance, to the United States, like a payroll to process, uh, you have to either get the consent of the European individual or you have to have in place protections that are equal to um, what Europe would have. And uh, the United States does not quite meet that standard. And it has negotiated for years to come up with uh, some alternative. It called one the safe harbor, and a court in Europe said, no, that's not, that's not adequate enough. So back to the drawing boards. And then the government came up with something called Privacy Shield, which wasn't m much more protective. And that's about where we stand now. A lot of American companies are just uh, 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 closing their eyes and ears to the reality that this regulation now has been updated, uh, beefed up made stronger and any company that processes data about Europeans is going to have to comply uh, by May and they're not impossible I think compliance uh, requirements um, at the same time as you imply the new administration has brought back a lot of uh, people in regulatory agencies who do not believe in regulation 
the most prominent, I guess, is the Environmental Protection Agency. But in the privacy field, the major agency is the Federal Trade Commission, which has the authority to uh, fine companies and to order them to change if they don't uh, comply with their own advertised standards. So that if they promise not to release your information, except uh, in certain circumstances, or if they promise to keep your information secure and they uh, experience a breach, that would be a violation of the Federal Trade Commission rule. And the prior FTC had been just getting quite vigorous in trying to uh, 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 get companies to abide by whatever privacy practices uh, they have announced. Uh, it has been the one way, actually, that the federal government has been able to not only get word of data breaches, but, but punish them, too. Um, so anyway, uh, now the Federal Trade Commission is three to two in the hands of those who do not believe in regulation at all and would hope that the marketplace would take care of all of this. Uh, the Federal uh, Communications Commission, which is the second lead agency in Washington, that is a place where privacy ought to be and can be protected. The FCC as well has uh, been uh, dominated now three to two by non-regulators, and we saw the result of that yesterday with a repeal of the so-called net neutrality rule that had required Internet service providers to treat all customers equally, whether they were huge uh, uh, uses of the internet, large companies, or whether they were just plain individuals. So net neutrality has been repealed by that particular Federal Trade Commission, excuse me, Federal Communications Commission. And also very early on in the administration, I think even before the inauguration day, the new chair of the FCC um, uh, threw out some rather promising privacy regulations that uh, would have brought internet service providers uh, into the uh, net of those companies that are subject to certain privacy protections. ISPs enjoy a great um, immunity from um, litigation that was put into law in the early days of the internet to try to make sure that its progress was not inhibited. But at any rate, if they screw a consumer or somebody else, uh, it is virtually impossible to sue the Internet service provider because the federal law says that they can't be sued. Um, and uh, there was a move to at least try to pin some obligations on ISPs to protect the privacy of all that personal information that they collect, this mass and masses of uh, content that they have in their control. And, uh, they had been proposed, and then after the election, um, they were disposed of almost as quickly. So you see the effect in the privacy regulation field very, very quickly, more so than in other fields perhaps, where um, individuals who have made a career out of uh, downplaying the uh, utility of regulation are now in charge of these regulatory agencies. Well. Robert, we've uh, spanned quite a range of topics here. We've gone from social media to the wired car to drones and smart speakers and social security numbers. Is there any other aspect that's at top of mind for you at the end of 2017 and heading into 2018 for the, for the year ahead that people should really be watching out for is into 2018 of what is on the forefront of protecting their individual and their family's privacy? Well, this is one area where I think individuals can do a lot for themselves regardless of, of the government. Uh, for, I mentioned just protecting themselves from drones and many people listening probably will be have, have more imaginative ways in which they can do that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, I, won't have, I won't go any further than that, but it's not an area where you, you, you have large corporations uh, necessarily uh, with all the power here because individuals at least we possess the information and we do possess the ability to go across the street as consumers if we don't like the privacy policies that are being offered so I continue to recommend to people they know everything about the technology that they're using and find ways to um, use it without giving up too much personal control um, and that's especially true with social media. They should find out what the attitudes are of the companies they deal with. 
demand to see their privacy policies. And uh, I hate to say it, but take the time to read them and, and to see what you're signing off on. Um, and uh, uh, know more about the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, which controls credit bureaus. We all know about the breach of Equifax last summer. It's one of the largest credit bureaus in the nation. And uh, so many people know very little about exactly what a credit bureau does. That would include most journalists, too. I don't think that they've done a good job of covering this breach at all because they, too, don't quite understand what a credit bureau does. And I hope people will go to the Internet and find out exactly what kind of information these companies have. That would be Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Those are the three major uh, credit bureaus. And uh, learn about other things, too, uh, um, the companies that issue our credit cards and the companies that uh, make up these uh, um, credit scores that are used so much to control our destiny. Um, so learn the technology, know what laws protect us and which ones uh, are, are available for our, our use. Those are the two best things I can recommend. And overall, uh, keep keep your social security number very close to your vest. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Robert Ellis Smith, again, everyone, is the editor and founder of the Privacy Journal. He is, uh, his work is at privacyjournal.net. If people go there, Robert, what will they find and how can they get more of your work? Well, thanks for asking. This privacyjournal.net, we have some excerpts from prior uh, issues of our uh, lead stories, and we invite people to ask for a sample copy if they want to read the whole story. But at any point, there are places on the website to ask for a sample copy of not only uh, well of the newsletter but also a list of all of our books we publish a history of privacy in the united states called ben franklin's website and we every year publish a, a guide to all the laws that uh, protect privacy um, so i invite people to go visit it and get in contact with us and we'd be happy to share a sample issue with them excellent thank you so much robert for joining us again here on reluctant preppers thank you 